look at approach to the distinct adult patient. Let's have a look at a case. All right, so it's a 24 year old female with a history of asthma, presents with sharpness of breath for two hours and wheezing. It's afebrile, blood pressure is 112 or 62, pulse is 122, respiratory rate is 28, oxygen saturation 92% on room air. Alert to kipnea, good air movement with bilateral expiratory wheezing. Case two, we have a 75 year old diabetic, male with sharpness of breath for four days. It's a history of COPD and congestive heart failure. No fever or chest pain, was lying down or with exertion. It's improved sitting up, dry cough. Temperature of 38, blood pressure 158 by 92, pulse of 92, respiratory rate of 18, oxygen saturation room air is 89%. So alert, no distress, irregular pulse, good air movement with crackles at the left base. Then you have case three, is a 32 year old female with no past medical history and reports gradual onset of mild shortness of breath for two days. No fever, cough, or chest pain. A febrile, blood pressure is 118 by 58, pulse is 84, respiratory rate is 26, O2 saturation on room air is 100%. Alert, no respiratory distress, normal lung and heart sounds. Right, so, what are the functions of the cardiorespiratory system? bring oxygen into the body, remove carbon dioxide from the body, deliver oxygen to the tissues, maintain the pH of the body. Shortness of breath will be filled if you interrupt any of these functions. Main causes of dyspnea are respiratory, cardiac, blood and metabolic acidosis. Now respiratory problems, upper airway, lower airway, lung tissue, lung vasculature and restriction of lung expansion. Upper AV problems, foreign body, tumors, swelling, inhalational injury, anaphylaxis, angioedema, then you have the infections of the pharynx and the neck, epiglottitis, peritonsillar abscess, retropharyngeal and deep space neck infection. So these are the upper AV problems you should think of. Low AV problems can include foreign body, including mucus, vomitis, and blood, tumors, asthma, and COPD. When you go down to the lung tissue problems, infections like pneumonia, TB, and abscesses, COPD, cardiogenic edema, or a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, as in acute respiratory distress syndrome. Then after that, you have a vasculature problems with the lung, so you can have pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary embolism, or acute chest syndrome as in sickle cell disease. Then pulmonary problems restricting expansion of the lung can include pneumothorax or pneumomediastinum, pleural effusions, scoliosis, abdominal distension, abdominal pain, neuromuscular problems like severe hypokalemia, Guillain-Barre, myasthenia gravis and ALS. Cardiac problems can include rhythm, vasculature, pump, and extrinsic to the heart. Now, rhythm problems can be atrial fibrillation, second degree block type 2, third degree block, bradycardia, supraventricular tachycardia, and ventricular tachycardia. Cardiac vascular problems include acute coronary syndrome. Cardiac pump problem can be low output heart failure like a cardiomyopathy, valve problem or myocarditis or high output heart failure as in hyperthyroidism, beriberi and AV fistula. Problems extrinsic to the heart can be cardiac effusion, cardiac tamponade, restrictive cardiomyopathy. Then blood problems can include severe anemia or hemoglobin toxins like carbon monoxide and methemoglobinemia. Then you can have Metabolic acidosis, ketoacidosis, lactic acidosis, and salicylates can cause problems. All right, so let's see what do you ask in a medical history. Okay, so use a systematic approach to address possible respiratory problems, cardiac problems, blood problems, and consider whether there is any concern about metabolic acidosis. Start with the airway and work through all the systems needed for oxygen delivery. 
in the medical history ask about sudden or gradual onset ask what makes it worse and what makes it better but so fever chest pain and cough now physical exam again use a systematic approach how do they look do they need immediate intervention before or start with the lips and oropharynx examine the neck examine the lungs examine the heart and peripheral pulses examine blood related problems all right so you start with initial stabilization and monitoring this may be the first thing to address prior to the interventions minimal is oxygen by nasal cannula sit the patient up start the iv put the patient on a monitor then maximum 100% non breather mask bipap intubate the patient assessment or diagnostic studies include a chest x-ray and ecg but should also consider white cell count hemoglobin renal function liver function cardiac enzymes arterial blood gases bnp and d dimer now ultrasound may be required of the suya dyspnea patient there are many different protocols out there so blue protocol etudis protocol and radius protocol all right so common features of the most distinct ultrasound protocols are cardiac example pericardial effusion so look at the contractility pulmonary so pneumothorax pleural effusion consolidation copd inferior vena cava look for ivc distension and collapsibility some protocols look for DVT in both the legs. So case one, 24-year-old female with a history of asthma presents with shortness of breath for two hours and wheezing. A for blind, blood pressure 112 or 62, pulse 122, respiratory 28, oxygen saturation 92%. Alert to tachypnea, good air movement, bilateral expiratory wheeze. And she was given nebulizer treatments and steroids with only mild improvement. The next day, a medical student interviewing the patient learned that she had a family history of pulmonary emboli. A test CT showed multiple pulmonary emboli. For the testing, revealed that she had protein C deficiency. So the diagnosis was a pulmonary emboli, and this was secondary to a hypercoagulable state as a protein C deficiency. Now let's have a look at case two. 75 year old diabetic male with shortness of breath for four days. A history of COPD and heart failure, no fever or chest pain, was lying down or with exertion, improved sitting up, right cough. Temperature is 38, blood pressure is 158, 92, pulse is 92, respiratory rate is 18, oxygen saturation in air is 89%. Alert, irregular pulse, good air movement with crackles at the left breast. White bed cells, 12,000. Chest X-ray shows left low lobe infiltrate. ECG shows new onset atrial fibrillation. Troponins increased. Diagnosis was made as pneumonia along with new onset atrial fibrillation and non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. Case 3 is a 32 year old female with no past medical history and reports gradual onset of mild shortness of breath for two days. No fever, cough, or chest pain. AFA bile, blood pressure is 118 by 58, pulse is 84, respiratory rate is 26, oxygen saturation on air is 100%. So alert, no respiratory distress, normal lung and heart sounds. So, the patient had a normal chest X-ray and ECG, a 9 gap was 18. Arterial blood gases revealed a pH of 7.28, PCO2 of 26, oxygen 110 and no mere. Blood glucose was normal, urine and serum acetone was positive. After further questioning, patient reveals that she is trying to lose weight and has only had water for the past 48 hours. Patient eats in the ED and receives IV fluid. Four hours later, her tachypnea, shortness of breath and acidosis have resolved. She discharged home. Can you think what the diagnosis is in this case? It's pretty easy. So it's ketoacidosis, secondary to starvation. And the key points are use a systematic approach when evaluating the dyspneic patient or you'll miss something. The systematic approach in the pediatric patient is the same. The differential diagnoses are slightly different and respiratory problems predominate. 
Consider more than one diagnosis, especially in older patients. Consider that prior diagnosis may be wrong. Be aggressive in early airway management. It's easy to deal with airway issues earlier rather than wait for things to worsen and doing crash airway management during COVID. I hope you liked this video. Please do not forget to leave your comments, share our videos and come back for more.